So you can see we're going to be looking at the cycle of grace this morning, and it's, it's something that's taken from Titus, and we'll get there in a minute. But to start with, I wanted to start with a bit of um, an illustration. So you have to imagine my friends. They're called Annabelle, Beatrice, Clara, and Delphine. And they were given a gift, um, and it was a beautiful gift, and it came in this amazing gift box here. And Annabelle, she just couldn't bring herself to open the box. She just wanted to look at the box. Beatrice was confident to open the box, and she got out the box this lovely present that had been wrapped. And in fact, she even went as far as opening the present. You sense the anticipation. Such a big box. But then she felt she needed to put it back in the box. Clara opened the box, opened the present, got it out, and proceeded to see if she could do a little haircut with it. And when that didn't go so well, she tried it sort of like a razor on her legs. And again, that didn't end too well. But Delphine, she got it out, got it out of the box, went to the fridge, found a carrot, got her peeler, and beautiful. You see, there was a gift, there was a purpose for the gift, and there was a certain context that that gift was meant to be used in. And in some ways, that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at a gift, a purpose for the gift, and the context for that gift to be used. And this isn't some kind of D.D. Smith 101 on top cooking tips for me. It's a spiritual 101. It's about how in our lives um, we, can, we can be encouraging one another with this gift and the purpose and its context. So um, I thought it would be helpful um, for us to, to remember this. Uh, we can do a bit of sign language. So here we go. The gift is grace. Grace, so that's a G. That leads to godliness. That's the purpose of the gift. That's another G. And the context is hope. As we wait in hope, that's an H. Okay, so I wonder, just while we go through this, there's going to be a repeated theme of GGH. So can you do it with me? G, gift, grace, that leads to godliness as we wait in hope. Okay, so you're going to hear this a lot. This is the, the kind of where we're going today. Now, this principle was one that was given by Jesus, and he gave it to the Apostle Paul, who gave it to Titus. And Titus was then meant to teach this principle to the elders and the church members, um, and then they were going to teach it to different groups within the church. See, it's a principle that gets passed around from one person to another in the church, um, and it will help all of us. It's for, this principle is for, for all of us here today. And it's a bit like a cycle. So we're going to read um, from Titus uh, chapter 2. This is 11 to 14. cycle. <coughs> For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So we'll, we'll go into the cycle then. The cycle is that grace has appeared. And this grace teaches us, this is our purpose, to become his people and to do what is good. And we live this out in the context of hope. And that hope is that Jesus, our saviour, is coming back and that eternal life will be fully realised. And so while we're waiting, we hold on to this grace and we teach others this doctrine so that they will become his people and do what is good. And we'll keep waiting in hope. And so the cycle goes round and round. I think at times we can oversimplify the Christian faith into that point of salvation. Um, a bit like that grace at the top. And 
and, and that moment of Jesus on the cross. And we can kind of, kind of so zone into that moment, that, um, which is, of course, hugely significant, and it's the bedrock to our faith. But I was thinking of it like this. Imagine that you lived in a filthy house, like filthy from top to bottom. Years of filth, grime, grease everywhere, in every cupboard, on every surface. There was nothing nice to look at. And the point of salvation is the point where Jesus comes into the house and he says, I'm going to clean your house from top to bottom. And he so cleans that house um, that there's not a speck of dust or grime or grease anywhere in any of it. But at the end of that process, he says, look, here's a hoover for you to have. And I think the point is that he then expects us to follow his ways. He expects us to use the hoover in the coming years to continue to follow in his good design, not to just put the hoover back in the box in the basement for the next 25 years. And I think this idea is that and in this cycle, we're to then follow his ways um, in, in, as he teaches us. So we're going to now zoom in a little bit on each part. So we'll start with grace. Now, what is grace? There's many ways to answer that question. Well, in this letter to Titus, um, we see that it's a person. It's Jesus, our saviour. That's how Titus describes it. Um, the very, very first um, part of Titus says this. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our saviour. And in some ways, obviously, seeing that Jesus is our, is, is grace, is our saviour, it only makes sense if we continue to bring to mind the backstory. You see, Titus said, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Well, to be honest, it's a pretty condemning statement. And if we sat down long enough and went through this in detail, I think we'd all realise that this does, to an extent, describe our patterns of relating, our patterns of thinking, some of our choices. <coughs> and before God, this is wickedness. And what makes it even more significant is this isn't just some personal preference that we have um, or just, more, just, just our kind of our life choice. No, actually, one day we will face our maker for our lives. And according to him, this is not his ways. And that is a big problem. So that is why grace is so wonderful. And it's why Jesus is so wonderful. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour. So Jesus will clean us. And with his clean life, he will give us a fresh start. So that's grace. And the cycle begins there, but it doesn't end there. You see, there's a purpose for our lives. God is making a people for himself. And it's going to be a people like him. We are not solo film stars in our own films. We're more like dancers in a choreographed show that he is directing. So grace teaches us to say no to some things and to say yes to other things. It teaches us to say no to the things that mean we ignore God and his ways and yes to things that make us more God-like, godly. And this isn't about just basically trying to not do things, sitting quiet, not barely breathing. No, this is a positive thing. This is, he wants us to live these good lives. He wants us to be eager to do what is good. And in the letter, Titus gets really practical and he starts to explore within the church in different groups what it would look like for us to be living out these godly lives. And I think what's so precious for us today is that particularly addresses this to older women and to young, younger women as he explores what this godliness will look like. And of course, that summarises us today, doesn't it? So we're going to take those two in turn. So starting with the older women. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. So older women are to be reverent in the way they live. 
their lives are to be lived with a sense that God is watching them and that they want to please him in all that they do. And this isn't just like a Sunday only. This is Monday through Sunday. At the shops, at home, with their friends, by themselves, in their downtime. In, in everything, they have an acknowledgement and a respect for the Lord. And this respect will naturally flow into others as well. So Titus has just said to the older men that they should be worthy of respect. And therefore it seems fitting that the older women should show the respect to the men to whom God has put around them. They're also not meant to be slanderers. How easy it is to speak ill of others, particularly when after years and years they have let us down, or maybe they've let other people down. How easy it is to let the mouths that God has given us to honour him become mouths that just dishonour other people. And they're not to be addicted to much wine. It might be easy, after many years of suffering, to try and numb what has been hard, maybe by wine, maybe by other things, but essentially trying to find comfort and satisfaction in things um, that will make themselves feel better about themselves or their circumstances. Now, these women are to be honourable in everything. But it's not just that to be honourable, they also have great purpose in this season of their lives. They have a mission that they need to discharge, and that mission is to teach and to urge the younger women in their daily walk of life. They have a role of coming alongside um, one another, and that's something we're going to come back to right to the end. But if you thought that was a tall order for the older women, the younger women are not off the hook. It says, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Younger women are encouraged both in their inner lives, but also in their relating to other people. In their relationships, they're to be other person-centered. They're to focus on the people that God has put in their lives. And this isn't just some kind of thing that he's come up with, some kind of top tips from Paul to Titus. No, this is part of this bigger picture of godly living and sound doctrine that Jesus is commanding Paul to teach Titus. In fact, as the younger women live out these principles, they'll actually be bearing witness to the word of God. Or if you put it negatively, if these women don't live out these principles, they will allow those looking on in their lives to malign or to scorn the word of God. Therefore, it's so significant that we unpack these carefully and we think about these carefully. Um, I, 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 was, um, I was helped um, when I first got married by this particular book. You won't be able to see it, but it's called Feminine Appeal, Seven Virtues of a Godly Wife and Mother by Caroline Mahoney, who's CJ Mahoney's wife. And someone gave this to me, and it basically takes each of those virtues that are given to younger women in turn and has a chapter on each of those. Um, and I'd love you, please, if you're, if you're wanting to see what it says or go deeper, borrow my copy or get in touch and I'll give you the details. You can get yourself a copy. But it's really worth us considering, you know, what these things actually look like so that we give credence to them and honour the word of God. To love our husbands and children, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to our husbands. And it's interesting that these qualities, they, they are often, they relate to our relationships. And I don't think this is just a practical thing. This isn't just about being busy and slogging it out and making sure we graft hard. No, this is a genuine grace-filled interest and compassion and kindness that's to be shown to those people who are put around these women. You see, it's so easy, isn't it, in our relationships to become dutiful maybe cordial, respectful, but that's so different from the the heartfelt compassion and kindness I think that that these verses are getting at. See, these young women are to let the grace of God so deeply into their own hearts that actually they're able to show a gracious love to other people. For women that are married, there's also a call to respectful submission, like taking their strength and then offering it to the leadership of another. 
I like to think of Jesus in the garden when he, he took his strength and he offered it to the will of the Father. We to submit, willingly submit to the men that God has placed alongside us to lead our families. And this business is focused around the home. So the woman's strength is to build up and bless the home. The home isn't some rival to the woman. Her time and the home. And they're kind of in conflict. No, her busyness is to bless the home. It's a principle we see in other parts of scriptures, like in Proverbs 31, where you see the very creative and industrious woman of noble character. She uses her strength, her business skills, her creative endeavours to bless and provide for the family that God's put around her. So those are the kind of external qualities, but there are also internal qualities for younger women. Younger women are called to be self-controlled and pure. And similarly similarly to, the, to the older women, younger women can't just split off aspects of their, their lives and decide which bits they're going to give over to these, this cool, you know, as if they could say, okay, yeah, family relationships, yes, but clothes, no. Food, yes, but sex, no. No, in every area, they're to exhibit this cool of God's way in self-control and purity. Now, I get that these characteristics aren't necessarily what people around us will be encouraging us in, but as this is the, the word of God, we need to consider and spend time prayerfully um, asking how we can allow these to take root in our lives, older women and younger women, so that we can be exhibited this godly character that God's calling us to. So we have grace, and it leads to godliness, a life of belonging to Jesus. But there is a context, and that is hope. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. I like to tell Lucy, my daughter, that I'm a princess. And I'm actually a real princess, not like those Disney ones. Because I have a father who is a king. And I know it's kind of playful with her, but there is a truth in that. You know, it is a rags to riches story for us. But it's our, it's our inheritance. We have an inheritance in Jesus. And sometimes I think our, our present reality can feel so real. Our bodily needs, our emotional needs, so pressing that we can lose track of this other context. But actually Jesus is coming back and we, we do know that there is life after death and we know that we need, need to live in light of that reality. And I think if we don't keep this context of hope in our minds, our focus just gets narrower and narrower. For myself, I feel that when I start keeping my context here, I start comparing, I start feeling jealous and envious, start being frustrated. And it's only as I allow my mind to enlarge and consider this, this context of hope that I'm able to, to wrestle with those things and put them back into their right context. We know the king and we're in his kingdom, but we are waiting, we're waiting women. And so that's partly why we're, we're here today. We've set aside this time because we need to remember and spur one another on in this walk of faith. One day we will finish this race and we will cross the line. But we need to keep pressing in and encouraging one another till we get to that point. So where do we go from here? That's the cycle of grace. I think the application from this cycle is that we are to teach and to learn. Now, I've already said that this letter is full of teaching. So there's Jesus teaching Paul, who are teaching the elders, who are teaching the older women, who are teaching the younger women, the younger women probably teaching the children. But to an extent, we could just say that grace is teaching everybody. So there's this principle here that this message of grace, the cycle of grace, needs to be shared. But actually those who are spiritually mature are called to get alongside those who would benefit from the guidance of a sister in Christ. And I think similarly, practically, older women are called to encourage and draw alongside younger, younger women in, in their life. And we do this to one another, older women with their sisters, younger women with their sisters. But by drawing alongside and teaching one another and urging one another in this walk of faith.
And what we're going to do in the next session after our break is we're going to get a bit more practical about that. There's going to be a seminar on spiritual friendship and looking into what it's going to look like to have those kind of relationships. But we're, we're called, aren't we, to encourage one another in this cycle of godliness, grace that leads to godliness in the context of hope. But there's also a call to learn. So this letter was shared among the churches, and that was a community of people, just like we're a community of people here today. We're learning from the Lord, but we're also learning from one another. So we've received grace together, haven't we? And um, now we're living alongside one another in our walk of godliness, and we're waiting together. So we need to keep learning together too. You see, understanding sound doctrine takes learning. It takes teaching, but it also takes learning. That's partly why we have this letter to teach us. But we need to keep responding. Actually, going deeper into this cycle will take an attitude of humility as we try and learn. Maybe for some of us, this is something that's new or unfamiliar. Well, that's going to take looking and learning. But for those of us who are familiar, to go deeper into it, deeper into godliness, that's going to take learning. We've zoomed into it today, haven't we? What it looks like as an old woman or a younger woman. But actually we need to continue to learn what it means to live good lives. At the the end of Titus, Paul says um, our people must learn to devote themselves to do what is good. I think it's interesting. We have to learn how to do what is good. It's something that we don't do it naturally. We need to learn. It's a process we need to learn. So I hope that you've seen that this is a, it's a beautiful cycle, but that there's also a response that we need to take away from this, to teach one another how to live in grace that leads to godliness in the context of hope, and to keep learning from one another. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go into little groups, and we're going to have a little bit of discussion. But let me just pray, and then I'll be more practical. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you did send Christ Jesus, our Saviour. We're so grateful that Jesus was willing to come and to clean us with his clean life. We're so grateful for that blood that was shed on the cross for us. We're grateful that we have a hope today, that you've you've touched our lives. And Lord, we want to be women who live out the purpose for that grace. We want to be women who are godly, So help us, Father, in this endeavour. And I pray that that we would not forget the hope that we have that you're coming back, Jesus. And as we engage in one another's lives, you would help us to teach and to learn, remembering this cycle. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sorry, I need to see the water. (coughs) So, Alison's going to come and explain the practicalities, but when we get into groups, there are two questions that I'd love you to discuss. Oh, my throat. One of them is, have you experienced these kind of mentoring, teaching, older women, younger women, teaching and learning relationships? Discuss that. Share when you have experienced those. And secondly, what barriers right now might stop you from wanting to be in that kind of relationship? What kind of puts you off? So over to Alison to explain the kind of practical side of things.